we lived on the Upper West Side, um, 106th and Broadway, and I had a studio up there in a, the one studio building in the neighborhood. And I, I had six months left that I could be there. Mm -hmm. So we started looking, and there wasn't anything else up there. Um, mm -hmm. So we started looking downtown. And Michelle Stewart, who is still to this day living on the other loft in this, this floor of my building, she and her then husband were friends of ours. And she said she knew this loft would be available because she could hear the couple who lived here fighting through the walls. She knew they were breaking up and she was right. Um, we were looking around and saw a number of other places, but within six months this loft became available and, um, and we moved here. And that was 1974. Wow, early. The studio I had uptown was a nice sized studio and I was doing uh, pretty big paintings there. Mm -hmm. And then I moved downtown and this studio, which was the studio of the artist who lived here before me, um, I was a little intimidated by the size of this studio. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I realized that I was working in an area the size of my former studio. Mm -hmm. I had sort of, that, that was my limit. And I, when I realized that, I, I said to myself, you, you have to expand and use this space. Mm -hmm. And you have to grow into it. And eventually, of course, I did. Mm -hmm. I see. And what kind of work did you do at the time? Um, when we moved here in 74, I was doing these pattern paintings and they became larger and eventually they moved off the wall and became installations. Mm -hmm. And um, I started working in ceramics. I started making tiles. I started making tile installations. I got a kiln um, and it was like a little cottage industry here. And I had studio assistants helping me and I was firing around the clock and that was late 70s into the 80s. Mm -hmm. I see. And I gave it all away. About You gave it all away? Why? I gave all the ceramics equipment away around the year 2000. I was through with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I gave it to Hunter College. Oh, you did? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the neighborhood like? It was... I'm sure other people have said the same things, but it was quiet. There weren't any uh, tourists. There weren't any, uh, there wasn't any uh, uh, very, very few businesses. Um, and almost everybody who lived here was an artist. So, I, you know, now the streets are flooded with people. I don't know any of them. Uh -huh. In those days, there were very few people in the street, but you tended to know them. Um, and it was dark at night and quiet and felt safe. Mm -hmm. And if you, took, if you were out late and you took a cab home, they could never find it. <laughs> yeah. Soho was both on the rise and degenerating as we came here in 1974. On one hand, the light industries and shops some of them sweatshops that had uh, characterized the place were being phased out. Mm -hmm. There was a, a program called AIR, mm -hmm. Artists in Residence, which established the possibility of artists renting cheap, large, well-lit spaces, which was, of course, terribly attractive to them and to us as part of that inflow. Mm -hmm. uh, Soho was uh, uh, an area that clearly had a future, and it was in this case an artistic future. The galleries in West Broadway were beginning to flourish, mm -hmm. uh, such that they be, seemed to have almost a monopoly on New York art life at a certain point. Uh, and the old funky shops and restaurants were being closed down, and the rents were growing up slowly, but still easily. So this was a period of change and transformation that I found very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any particular stories uh, or that you sort of want to tell us? Or? Yes. There is one story that I think illustrates beautifully the sociology of Soho. Joyce mentioned that we had these friends, Paul and Miriam, who were older artists, 
and we hobnobbed and buddied with them. One night we went to a local restaurant on Prince Street. It had formerly been called E.H. Cast, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Now it was called W.P.A. In other words, a kind of a rather ironic reference to the work program of the artists in the 1930s during the Depression. Now we were settled down, ordering our meal and our wine, and the sommelier came over asking us what wine we desired, and Paul mentioned a wine. The sommelier raised his nose, uttered a dismissive remark, and said that that was a no good wine, and we were amateurs. Paul <laughs> took offense at this and said, my good sir, you don't recall that it was only with the influx of artists into this area that the carriage trade became a reality and created restaurants like yours. There's no reason for you to have sniffishness and hauteur. Be gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the affection somewhat, somewhat corrupted that we feel towards New York and Soho was aptly represented by a remark attributed to the poet John Ashbery. Ashbery said, after living in New York, one can't be happy living anywhere else, even in New York. <laughs> Do you still have a soft spot in your heart for Saha? I guess so. I guess so. <laughs>